Well, Native Americans lived in Golden Valley long before Europeans showed up. We have some nice lush valleys where they would have been protected from the elements, and there was a lot of firewood, so they could have stayed warm here. The community has grown from a farming community to a residential, industrial, commercial. It's kind of like a, a, a badge of honor uh, that these major corporations would choose to uh, locate and headquarter in Golden Valley. The infrastructure has been a major feature in Golden Valley's growth and stability and development. This is a, uh, a good location to live, it's a good location to work, it's a good location to, you know, to recreate. There was lots of woods, uh, lots of bogs, lots of lakes, wetlands. Golden Valley is pretty much a swamp and so the roads worked around and a lot of them followed the Indian trails. The Indians worked their way around the, the swamps and lakes. Well, Native Americans lived in Golden Valley long before Europeans showed up. This area was probably used mostly in the winter because we have some nice lush valleys where they would have been protected from the elements and there was a lot of firewood so they could have stayed warm here. Some of the glaciers that came through created the topography that we have in Golden Valley. The hills, the swales, the lakes that are here, a lot of that is the result of glaciers that came through. There were a lot of trails along Bassett Creek, so we know that they were familiar with the area and moved through here. Now the Indians trapped and, and, and uh, had furs that they put in their canoes and they went down Bassett Creek to, to uh, the Mississippi River, then the Fort Snelling to the training post there. In 1851, the Coercive Treaty of Mendota was signed, and that gave Native Americans in the area two years to move west to a reservation on the Minnesota River. After the 1851 treaty, people came up the Mississippi and they came here to farm the land. The territory was opened up by the federal government. They had gone through and surveyed the territory, and they opened it up to uh, people who wanted to, and to encourage uh, expansion of the uh, population. The early settlers in Golden Valley, many of them came from the East Coast and they were Yankees. We also had some new immigrants from Ireland trying to escape the famines over there, and a lot of German-speaking farmers. So folks were moving into the area. Billy Jones and John Garrity were some of our earliest settlers. They arrived from Chicopee Falls, Massachusetts. Also, William Varner and his family came from Ohio. John Garrity and Jones were friends, and uh, they uh, migrated to uh, Golden Valley. They were amongst the first farmers. Some of the early settlers also started market gardens, so they would farm here and bring that produce into Minneapolis for sale. And selling in Minneapolis was really attractive because it worked better than the bartering system that they had as early settlers. They could get hard cash to buy the things that they needed. So the market gardens are interesting because it shows them moving from a bartering system to a more economic system. Eventually we had seven greenhouses in Golden Valley. In its very early years, there was a large landscape um, greenhouse located where Courage Center is. And it was an area that was somewhat well known in the whole region as having a tremendous large greenhouse and people would come there and buy and sell flowers and floral arrangements. That existed from the 1880s to about the 1920s. It's an interesting story about how Golden Valley might have gotten its name. William Varner, it is said that he walked over the top of a hill and looked down into the valley and saw a, a beautiful golden flowers. He got to a high point on what is now the Golden Valley Country Club, and he looked down in a valley, a lush valley dotted with yellow flowers, and decided this was a Golden Valley, and he wanted to live here and name it Golden Valley. In 1886, there was a vote for Golden Valley to incorporate as a village. There were 78 votes for becoming a village and one vote against. We don't know much about that vote, but I'm very interested in it. Some of the people involved with incorporating as a village were the Shides, the Sweeneys, and the Varners. So many of our early residents were involved with incorporating as a village. They at that time had the citizens vote to decide whether they would become a form of government under a charter or under two options that were available under state law. And one was statutory A and one was statutory B. The citizens of the city voted and decided they would be a statutory 
B city. That meant that they would have a hired city, and they called him at that time then city manager. The council then became the policy-making body, and the mayor and council were working together then to decide what the policies were and give direction to the city manager. The railroad line that runs along the essentially the northern boundary of Golden Valley near Winnetka Avenue where the city hall is at one time was a very uh, prominent bustling railroad area with grain shipments that coming in from the west and going out to the west and other commodities. One of the famous Minnesota zoning cases concerned a structure that was built on the, on the area where that railroad line now is. It's roughly where the McDonald's is in uh, Golden Valley on Winnetka. The railroad owned that area uh, back in the day and the railroad wanted to construct sh homes, sheds some call them, on that area there in order to house its workers. The area back in those days was not zoned for residential. So the railroad built this, these homes on the land that now is occupied by the library and the McDonald's in Golden Valley. It led to a big conflagration with the city which did not want those houses there because it wasn't zoned properly. The case went all the way up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court upheld the city's position that the railroad could not build these houses on that property because the property lacked the proper zoning. The railroad argued that this wasn't a residential development. These were buildings that were used to house its workers so it was really commercial rather than residential. But the importance of that case is it established some very significant doctrines in Minnesota's zoning law as to what constitutes residential versus commercial property. It, those, that case gets cited often by lawyers litigating zoning cases. And it all happened right here in Golden Valley. Chris Ewald and his, his brother and his mother, they came to, to Minneapolis and they started uh, a dairy farm in the Hiawatha area. Then the Minneapolis Park Board decided that they wanted to take over that area for a park. And so Chris Ewald ended up moving their cattle, driving them through the city of Minneapolis into Golden Valley. The Ewalds had a farm over off of Winnetka and Harold area. They had a barn up there off of Ewald Terrace and they had their golden Guernseys because that was their tag that uh, you know, their milk came from Golden Guernseys. And many people have fond memories of those milkmen coming to their house to deliver everything from orange juice to milk to butter to sour cream. They were a real part of people's lives for a long time. There was a need for educating the, the children and so the farmers got together and they built a, a one-room schoolhouse. Billy Jones and some of the other early residents built the first school in Golden Valley in 1858. It was the Oak Grove School. It was just a one-room log cabin structure. All the students were in the same room, taught by the same teacher from, from first grade all the way up to maybe eighth grade. Meadowbrook School was one of our early schools. And that's still around as an elementary school. Several others came in and different school districts were established. Some of the residents of Golden Valley were interested in, in having their own school district. Those neighbors wanted that school district. They worked hard for that. They built a high school and uh, operated for, for several years. It had an excellent academic program that rivaled any suburban school in the Twin Cities. In 1980, the school, um, Golden Valley School District had to merge. We just, because of state law and how they funded schools, we just could no longer make it. If Golden Valley could have held off just for a few more years till open enrollment, that school would have never closed. One of the interesting factors about the two school districts is the school boundaries, the district boundaries, uh, wander between houses and, and, and uh, are very confusing. Your neighbor might be going to Robbinsdale High School 
or, or Armstrong High School, and, uh, and the next door neighbor will be going to the Hopkins High School. And that's confusing to the people, to say the least. When I look at like St. Louis Park and Edina and I see, you know, those school districts are pretty contiguous with the city boundaries, um, it makes a big difference in the, the small town feel of a community and I think that it's hurt Golden Valley. By the late 1970s, Breck was looking for a new facility. By that time it had outgrown its rather small rural, largely Episcopalian roots. It was a larger private school. It needed more space and it needed a large facility. Golden Valley was out of business now as a public school. It had a vacant site there and there were two interested parties. Breck School looking for a facility for, it, for its school and the Minnesota Vikings. The Vikings were very interested in that site for a number of reasons. The size was good. The building was probably larger than it needed, but it gave enough size where they could put, convert that to dormitories on campus for players. It had a nice football field, and the location was very convenient right at the intersection of Highway 100 and Golden Valley Road. Ultimately, they got outbid by Breck, and Breck decided to, it was more important for them to have that facility than the Vikings, and they offered more money for it, and they bought it from the Golden Valley public school system. I think Golden Valley is rich with history when it comes to our schools, uh, whether it be the private schools or the public schools. And in some cases, the, the two overlap in the respect. I mean, you think about the Golden Valley uh, High School, uh, of, of what it once was and now today, it's a private school, it's Breck School. It's one of the premier private schools in the metropolitan area, and for that matter, in the entire state. The community has grown from a farming community to a residential, industrial, commercial. In the turn of the century, we had 500 residents here. By 1965, we had 23,000. The 50s were the big growth time for Golden Valley. People coming back from the war, uh, first spring suburb, houses were being built. After World War II, then the when the GIs came back from the war, there was a demand for more housing, and that's when they started making uh, uh, developments in various parts of Golden Valley, starting with the eastern part and going back to the west. We were right next to Minneapolis, so the next phase moving west was Golden Valley. Paulinghauser was a developer with um, Hub Nelson. They wanted, didn't want it to look like Minneapolis with the just square. They wanted to have the curvy roads and have a different, more open feel. I think a lot of people have moved to Golden Valley because of that open space and what we have to offer. And Paul Inghauser really brought that concept to our city. The infrastructure has been a major feature in Golden Valley's growth and stability and development. The highway system is, uh, has created some opportunities for us. I mean, for sure, back in you know, the 50s uh, and the 60s, as the, the infrastructure here in Golden Valley was developed, I mean, these highway systems, Highway 55, Highway 12, which is now Highway 394, Highway 169, the, the Beltway, which is now Highway 100, it brought people to Golden Valley, not only for work, but to also you know, to settle down here. Highway 100 was part of what they called the Beltway. And the Beltway was to go all the way around the cities in the 20s when they came up with this idea, and this was an innovative, a truly innovative idea. They were thinking ahead, you know, because, because where Highway 100 is, was gonna end up, was nowhere. Why are they building a road? Out in the middle of nowhere. But they, not only were they thinking about um, this Highway 100, this north-south, and the concept being that I could drive out Highway 12 and go down to, or north up to Highway 55 and then go back into the city into a different part rather than try to manage the traffic within the city itself. So that was the concept. But even as they were talking about that, they had already said, well, when this beltway is uh, full or being used, we can build the next one. So they were already thinking 169 and 494 beyond that. And so that, that kind of blew me away that in the 20s, they were already thinking of that much expansion. We set at least a foundation 
We're improving um, highways and tra transportation in a way that we're benefiting from today. And it was foresight on the part of the uh, planning people in Golden Valley and the state that helped uh, accomplish that. Early on, there were no parks because they were, we did not start our park board until 1948. But it was in the 50s that those parks started to come into play. In 1952, my dad joined the park board and that is really when it took off. Well, there was one individual who was a member of the city council. His name was Ray Stockman. And Ray Stockman was a firm believer that uh, there should be more parks for the kids to play in. And so he went around and talked to the owners of property that had, <coughs> or the developers, and saying, uh, the, how about donating some of your land so that we can make it a park for your community? He was actually the father of the park system in Golden Valley. As people were moving into the west of Golden Valley, they would actually call and ask if there was a park proposed for that area because they did not want to buy a house that there weren't going to be any parks. New parks have been developed, new, uh, softball fields have been added. We're always looking in Golden Valley for ways to improve our parks and recreation. We're never satisfied with what we have here and I think that's an important reason why uh, the park and recreation uh, facilities are so good. It's important that we reinvest in our parks. It's important that we reinvest in our infrastructure. The way that we stay ahead of the curve is through innovation. And one way to do that is by continuing to uh, reinvest and, um, and to uh, uh, fortify our infrastructure that we have and our park and maintenance, you know, our park and recreation system. I talk about Shopper Park and being the only, uh, the only city that has a, a, a ninja, ninja Warrior course in the entire state. We have nine community parks, 11 neighborhood parks, and we have special area parks like Isaacson, Sahaki. I mean, the city feels it's important to invest in these types of innovative park and recreation activities and infrastructure because it builds that community, it adds to that quality of life. Theater Worth was always, we used to go down there on our bikes in the summertime and swim at the beach, and then they had the Aqua Follies there. They had like this little stadium and it was really weird because it just sat right on the lake. And you know, now you do stuff like that. They're in like a pool. They're not in, in an actual lake. The aqua follies were, were uh, on, uh, on the lake. They had precision swimmers and, uh, and, and entertainment. It was, it was well, well attended. Brookview has a very interesting history. It started as a private golf course known as Superior Golf Course around the time of World War I. And by the end of World War II, uh, because of changes in demographic patterns, economic issues and the like, uh, the original owners of Brookview, they decided to sell it. In 1957, they wanted to buy a club. People worked really hard to get that referendum through. But it did pass, and we bought Brookview for $1.25 million. And a year, year and a half ago, we updated or redid it for $18.5 million. And it is beautiful today. We're so proud of it. But our golf course is having their 50th anniversary of becoming a municipal golf course this year. The, the old Brookview building was uh, adequate, but it was falling apart. To keep redoing it's like an old car. You can just keep fixing the rust, but it's gonna die anyway. There wasn't uh, enough interest to build a very beautiful facility now. And it has an indoor playground for little kids uh, and uh, many meeting rooms. Building our new Brookview is beautiful. It's just opened up events for us and meeting rooms. So to me, that's probably one of the biggest things since I've been on the console.
Women were a major force in bringing about the Human Rights Commission. One of the leaders in that organization was Sylvia Kaplan, who at that time, in the mid and late 60s, was the editor of the weekly newspaper in Golden Valley. And she was one of the mainstays of creating the Human Rights Commission and also encouraging more people, more women to become active in civic affairs and politics. The first woman elected to the city council in Golden Valley was Pat Moberg and she was a league member. She had also been active on the Human Rights Commission and she was elected and started serving in 1972. Golden Valley became a haven for women in significant leadership positions. Rosemary Thorson in 1978 became the first woman mayor of Golden Valley well before other communities had women mayors. She was committed to the community. She was very involved in a number of issues and uh, recognized uh, the need to involve people in the community. It meant to the, to the league and uh, to the women involved a great uh, advancement and victory uh, that women could be recognized as being able to participate and work uh, together with men as uh, elected officials. There have been other women mayors since then. Golden Valley's had three women mayors, Mary Anderson, Linda Loomis, they all served long terms. The league was the one that I was first involved in and got me involved in community activity. Mary Anderson was a mayor of Golden Valley for many years, was a chair of the Metropolitan Commission, so she has brought to Golden Valley a real broad outlook to how suburbs should be run, how they should interact with other communities. The concept of a human rights commission in Golden Valley was stirred in the mid-60s, and that was uh, part of the growing uh, civil rights movement, which is reaching a climatic point in the late and mid-60s. We had a reputation for um, not being so welcoming. An incident at um, a facility known as The Point, which was a supper club, nightclub in Golden Valley, and it tended to attract a minority crowd. They hired a black musician who lived in Minneapolis and drove to the point here in Golden Valley. And there was a time where uh, his name was Oliver Lyle. And he, uh, uh, every time he drove to Golden Valley, either coming or going, he was pulled over by a Golden Valley police officer. And he filed a lawsuit against the city of Golden Valley and the police officer and police chief. That got some people a little bit irritated for the fact that the police department were, were preventing people from coming and going who were of a different color. There was a group of citizens that met in a private home that was called Action Now. Action Now was a human rights organization that was active for the, in the 60s, 70s. And they decided what can we do to change the attitude of the community and, and they had a program and projects and they were successful in getting people to realize that uh, that, that is not something that is acceptable in Golden Valley. There's a lot of people here in Golden Valley that have done a, a lot to try to change that too. John Mitchell was on the council when, when uh, I think Pat Moberg first joined. Uh, he is the first black person that was elected to the council in Golden Valley, and I think he served just for one term. But he was the one that started the uh, February Black, uh, Black Heritage um, Project, and also was instrumental in getting the first Human Rights Commission in the state of Minnesota in a community. Uh, so he was a, an advocate of uh, integration and did a fine job. Some of our major corporate partners, especially the, the ones that have been here for a long time, um, they discovered Golden Valley and saw that it was a good location being so proximate to uh, downtown Minneapolis. We're fortunate to have those big um, companies. General Mills uh, built uh, their headquarters over on 169 and, and Wysetta Boulevard. And then Honeywell had a, built a plant on Douglas Drive. The tenant company uh, bought a piece of land on Douglas Drive and Highway 55 
and they built a factory. Uh, they, they are one of the world's largest manufacturers of floor cleaning equipment, uh, internationally known. What happened is these large companies became uh, centered in Golden Valley with Allianz and General Mills and the like. In Golden Valley, uh, it is said, and I think it's true, now has, that more people work in Golden Valley than live in Golden Valley. We employ about 33,000 people a day in Golden Valley, and we have about 20,000 residents, so we really are a hub for the workplace. The large companies, the Fortune 500 companies, provide an economic base for the smaller companies, the smaller businesses. The Golden Valley then became a city that had uh, a greater proportion of land zoned commercial industrial, which added to the tax base, which helped our city as far as raising its uh, money to run the city. Businesses, they contribute to the community, you know, so they are active in supporting the local community. Some of these corporate partners actually contributed financially to the building of our city hall in the 1950s. And they still contribute to our community through our Golden Valley Community Foundation or through, uh, you know, making contributions to our uh, crime prevention fund. Uh, Don Byerly is another example of someone who's been a signature person in Golden Valley. Don Byerly uh, lived in California and he saw the, the, the stores there, a, a particular store, had carpeting on the floor, wide aisles, and were open uh, long hours. And uh, he decided he, that would, would work in Minneapolis and so he found a site in Golden Valley that, on uh, Highway 100 and Duluth Street and built uh, uh, his first grocery store there. It was a great asset to the city to have Don Byerly decide to locate here. Byerly's brought a new type of shopping to the Twin Cities community. Lunds had done some of that, but Byerly's doing it in the suburbs, have created a whole new kind of shopping experience for people that they weren't uh, familiar with before. And today when we see the Trader Joe's and the Whole Food stores and other stores, they are in many respects derived from and the beneficiaries of the Byerly's pattern of selling uh, groceries. It's kind of like a, a, a badge of honor uh, that these major corporations would choose to uh, locate and headquarter in Golden Valley. I think it says something about who we are and what we can provide as a service uh, that they feel that this is the right place for their future. Golden Valley Garden Club uh, thought that Highway 100 should be beautified with something and so they talked to the highway department the highway department said yeah that's fine uh, and so they had a fundraiser to buy lilacs and they fund, and they did. The Garden Club this is their 80th year and they were instrumental in getting lilacs planted on Highway 100 and getting that named as Lilac Drive and um, the Garden Club has been probably the um, organization with the longest continuous operation in the city. There's always been a Garden Club. The Garden Club was extent was really influential in uh, developing Lilac Days. The Lilac Festival was a big deal. It used to like go for a whole week and there would be a golf tournament. They would have a big banquet up at the Golden Valley Country Club. Um, they had the Queen Coronation, and there was, it was just a lot of stuff. There was a parade, the Lilac Parade. Um, so it just seemed like it was the thing to do. There was also a very strong Lions Club, and this would have been in the 19, 1958, late, early 60s. Uh, and they were the, they were really the, the, pe the people who did things for the community. The Rotary uh, has been very influential in their work in our community. They planted trees uh, in Brookview Park uh, and also Bassett Creek Park. Uh, they have scholarships for high school kids going on to college. The Optimist Club uh, was a club that was focused on helping youth in the community. The club itself was a Golden Valley Optimist Club for many years, which is still active and still works to uh, help youth in the community, provide scholarships. 
We have the Pride Festival. It's really our biggest event. It's wonderful. It's not part of the city. It's its own entity. But, you know, we've had about 5,000 people come. We're very proud of it. And it's just accepting and working and being with, you know, our community members. We have um, a community of 22,000 residents now. That's during the nighttime, that's during the weekends. During the daytime, yeah, we're talking 35,000 uh, corporate citizens, if you want to say. Um, and going forward, looking to the future, it's very possible that that could be closer to 45,000. You know, private property developers are a lot of what drives things right now in the financial world. And, you know, I think that's why you're seeing so many apartments being built right now, because that's where people are able to get financing for. Um, so there, right now, multifamily apartments are the thing. We've added about 1,200 new apartments, and it's giving another way of uh, housing for our house that we didn't have. When people can bring alternative perspectives, and we can learn about different cultures, we can learn about different faiths, we can learn about different languages, uh, you learn about the history of where people came from and it just adds more uh, excitement and more interest and more richness and just makes it all the better for our community. The Golden Valley History Museum is so important for our community so that they can see the stories and interact with them in person. The Golden Valley Historical Society had wanted to build a museum for many, many years and they were lucky enough and fortunate enough to have a donor who helped us build this building. We came together and put together the exhibits on the inside. Everybody knows Donnie Anderson. I think he probably should be called Mr. Golden Valley. If he isn't, he's been the historical society. Not to discount other people who play a major role, but Don is the bearer of the history of Golden Valley. He has been the instigator of this whole thing. Without him, we would not have it. I think the historical society you know, is, is a key part, just like the schools, the churches, the city. Uh, it, 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 it holds the community to, together. We are so lucky to have the Historical Society in the museum. It's so important, you, you don't know where you're going unless you know and respect your past. And it's important for us to know our heritage, to know our history, and to, uh, in a sense, to continue it forward. And we're so fortunate that the Historical Society and the museum have been able to provide that to us. It really is a gift. If people were to, to, to join, become members, it, it would help them like it helped me become more of a Golden Valley citizen. The Golden Valley Historical Society is always looking for more volunteers. We have a lot of fun projects that we want to pursue. We can do research, we can clean up the collections, you can work as a volunteer greeter in the museum. So there's really a place for every talent. Anyone who wants to be involved can help us share Golden Valley's history.